beautiful. Beautiful in a way that we all know. Makes what we watched in the last clip seem not beautiful at all. But beautiful in a way that would take a lot of time to describe why. I want to reframe the central message of tonight. It's that we are called to live lives that reveal the beauty of this man. Christ Jesus, the slain and standing lamb. And if we do, it will captivate the world around us and prophesy of the coming age to come where Jesus does finally make all things new. <laughs> this is not a curated beauty. This is a now and not yet kind of beauty. It's a beauty found in true authenticity. You don't need wealth to embody this beauty. You don't need to look a certain kind of way, come from a certain type of family, wear a certain type of clothing, drive a certain type of car. You don't need a certain type of life. You need authenticity, honesty, humility, because if we give Jesus that, he will make all things new. And he will make beautiful what is not beautiful. He will restore, he will redeem. And his beauty will emanate through all of you. The good, the bad, the ugly, your wounds and your warts, your fears and insecurities, your trials and disappointments your shame and your failures, your hopes and your dreams. Jesus can permeate all of these things. He will make all of them new. He turned the cross from a symbol of torture into an icon of hope. And he will do the same with every part of your life that you give to him. So how do we do this? How do we give our lives, offer them wholly to Jesus so that the beauty of this man can permeate our lives? That's a good question. It's a big question. And here's my answer for you. It's by giving yourself to a lifelong inside out journey. It is a lifelong journey inside out journey of following Jesus. The first time that we see the Holy Spirit coming upon a person in the Bible, it was upon an artist named Bezalel. And he was anointed by the Spirit to create a temple, a tabernacle, a place where heaven and earth would come together and be one. And I believe that this anointing was the first prototype that speaks to the life of the new covenant believer, the Christian anointed by the Spirit. That the Holy Spirit comes upon us to make us a temple. To make us a place where heaven and earth come together. Where the redeeming, resurrecting power of heaven infiltrates into the brokenness of our dust, our wounds, our flaws, our deep failures and fears, our inadequacies, our brokennesses, the traumas we've experienced, the sins. Heaven and earth come together and he makes us a temple. And as he makes us a temple from the inside out, he then sends us out to the dark and unredeemed places to then spread that temple and create temples everywhere we go. Pastor Justin shared this Willard quote. I'm just doing it again to show that there's, there's a theme to what we're speaking of here. This was Dallas Willard. He says, individually, 
the disciple and friend of Jesus who has learned to work shoulder and shoulder with his or her Lord stands in this world as a point of contact between heaven and earth, a kind of Jacob's ladder by which the angels of God ascend and descend into human life. Thus the, thus the disciple stands as an envoy or a receiver by which the kingdom of God is conveyed into every quarter of human affairs. The Holy Spirit is given to us to sanctify and beautify us, to make us a temple, to make us a Jacob's ladder, to make us a place where people come into contact with heaven and therefore with the king of heaven through our lives. This is the marvel of the gospel, that Jesus is committed to using you and me, that he is committed to making all things anew. Like, did you see the determination? I love what they captured in this. He clung to his cross, that he chose the cross because he was determined to redeem everything. And I am so glad that my little life from the dust is part of the bullseye, the target of his determination. That he gave everything because he's so committed to redeeming everything. Everything tarnished and destroyed and made ugly by the sin and the darkness of this world, he is determined to redeem it. So he sends his spirit to sanctify and beautify us. And it's an inside, outside work. He makes us a temple, a dwelling place, a Jacob's ladder. And then he sends us out to ambassador that into the city, to create it in our cities, in our relationships, in our friendships, in our communities, in our worlds. We get captivated by beauty. We get transformed into beauty. And then we get sent to prophesy beauty. This is good news, guys. And as I said, this process is a lifelong inside-outside journey. I just want to say a few things about the inside journey. It's much deeper than many evangelicals uh, know. The evangelical church has a fairly superficial understanding. I'm speaking broadly, but a fairly superficial understanding of the inward journey. And part of this is because the Protestant movement kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater and we lost about 1,400 years of our Catholic brothers and sisters who pioneered this deep inner way, all, tracing all the way back to the second century with the Desert Fathers and this rich heritage of what it means to be transformed from the inside out into the likeness of Jesus. I'll tell you a story. I'll just, I'll just tell an embarrassing story of myself. Make my point. It was probably about, I don't even know how old I was. I was in my early 20s. I had been in about a three or four year struggle with addiction. Uh, sexual addiction. I, I just could not get free. I fasted. I prayed. I confessed to every pastor in my life. I pleaded with God. I did everything. And it was, you know, it, it's like I had to work all the way to the end of myself. And it's like, I can't do it. And he liberated me. Praise be to God, by the way. That's really good news. Right? So I'm free. I'm like free. I'm living in sobriety. I'm like free. It was like that was the last attachment to outer sin in my life. And it was probably a few months after this. I remember I was in the morning. I was seeking the Lord. I'm like, man, I have not sinned in months. And, I, and, and the amazing thing is I didn't even desire it anymore. He actually changed the desire. So it was, it was real. It was a huge breakthrough. But I was kind of like, man... Do I need to praise much more? Like, I, I feel like I've arrived. Like, I think I'm, I think I'm there. I'm like, and I, I probably said it just about like that too. Like, and I remember thinking, I'm like, this doesn't feel right as I'm saying it, but that's how I feel, you know? So God honors our authenticity. And yeah, I found out it was probably another few weeks and I realized, oh, not, not quite as good as I thought, right? But th the point being is I think that kind of smugness comes when you don't have a roadmap for the depth of the journey. No one ever told me that this was going to be decades long and that the Lord would continue to be working and forming Christ in me 30, 40, 50 years into my story with Jesus and actually give me vision for why I want to pay the price to keep going deeper, growing my identity to be found completely, finally, out of union with Jesus. 
You know, my, my, my spiritual father, spiritual director, he's in his 70s, a wise, incredible man of God who has labored in the gospel for years and years and has gone on this journey. We, we talk about once a month and I always hang up going, my goodness, I'm just like a little baby because of the way I get to see Christ in him and the way he gives context to make me understand the next stage of depth to my story of dying to me and living to Christ. Yeah, just to give you some suggested reading, if you want to dive a little bit into this yourself, St. Teresa of Avila, a Spanish saint, she wrote an amazing book called Interior Castle, where she describes the spiritual journey of a life as if it was seven different mansions of the heart. And, 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 and the overall theme is that you go from the outer things and the outer attachments to the inner things. But then you get to stages where, and, and you know, they're, they're trying to give wisdom and language. It's not a cookie cutter process, but they're giving language to make sense. And, you know, you, you break from the outer sins and then you start to actually grow in love with God. And then, and you progress in your prayer life and you start to grow in the prayer life and the works of charity and the works of ministry. But then all of a sudden you hit a roadmap where the very things that God was using to catalyze your spiritual growth, he turns on you and they don't work at all anymore. And you go into what they call the dark night of the senses and God puts you in his waiting room. He says, no, 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 it's not about you anymore. Not about what you can do. You got to learn how to wait and you have to agonize in this new waiting because God is working because he has a journey of a life to form Christ in you. We've got to see the journey. And that's not the, the full heart of this message tonight, but I just, I just offer this as a invitation to not grow weary and not think that you've arrived because you haven't. And if you think you've arrived, you're a lot further than you think. <laughs> St. Teresa has this picture of spiritual growth that has just, it's stuck with me for years. And she describes it, it relates, it relates very pertinently into my life right now because I have a toddler. And, and she describes it, she has this vision and it's like Father God is standing at the top of a staircase and there's the staircase down, and the toddler is down at the bottom of the staircase, and he knows that the toddler is completely unable to climb the stairs. Like, they're just too big. He or she cannot do it. But the father has this dilemma of heart because he also knows that if he goes down to pick her or him up, she will throw a fit because she's going to do it herself. I had this wise idea to try to teach my daughter how to putt yesterday. So I was, took her to the store to buy her a little putter. I'm like, this is going to be a great daddy-daughter date. Come on. We get, get to the store, and she's like, I do it. I do it. I'm like, okay, let me just teach you once. She's like, okay, okay. She like sits down. I'm like, we like try to do it. She's like, no, no, dad, I do it. I do it. And she proceeded for the next 40 minutes to not let me help her one time as she's literally almost hitting people and swinging. And I'm like, okay, this just, this just isn't going on right. And that is us with God. No, no, no. I do it. I do it. I do it. No, no, no. I got it. I got it. Me. And, and so the father is at this staircase knowing he has to wait for that child to try again and again and again and again and again until finally they collapse and say, dad, dad. And, and, and there's something about this that the work that we give in the journey is the work of coming to the end of ourselves. We're not able to climb the staircase and mature into the likeness of God. It is by his grace. And yet it requires all of us to give ourselves again and again and again that we would give until we get to that place of the exhaustion of self. And we say, Daddy, I need you. And there's this strange paradox of the way of spiritual growth where true spiritual maturity makes us more humble as we become more wise. Because it's, it's not about self. We're increasingly weaned off of knowledge and comprehension. Growth in God is measured in terms of trust and love. St. John of the Cross called this an illuminative an illuminative darkness where there remains great mystery in our walk with God as we mature. There's actually more mystery than at the beginning, more things that we don't understand. There's a, a darkness that's like, I can't fully understand your ways. And yet at the same time, this illuminating light where it's like, I trust you. I trust you. I love you and I trust you. And there's just, there's just this 
beautiful lifelong journey of the inward, the inward story, yes? At every stage of maturation, the Spirit is working to form and reveal Jesus in you, in me, to create beauty from brokenness, peace, wholeness, and shalom out of the mire of sin and death. It's a continual movement from superficiality into substance. And as we yield to this journey of a life at every new season of the soul, Jesus is sending the Spirit to reveal beauty. To reveal to you that you are beloved to God. Despite it all, that you are absolutely captivatingly beautiful to him. You are his beloved People who yield to and embrace this process, this messy and broken process, who yield to and embrace the messy and broken parts of their own stories, and not just the parts that are in the past, by the way. Oh, those are the easy Christian testimonies. I did that five years ago, and now look at me. But it's people who embrace that, no, we are still in process. The Spirit is still working to form Christ from the outer to the inner, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And those with eyes to see and ears to hear will know there are still broken, ugly parts of me. There are still ugly and broken parts of me that, I, that I'm learning to, to, what to do with and let, to be loved by, right? Like this is the journey, right? But it's those very people that have experienced God turn their brokenness into beauty, they're they're the ones that are sent out into a broken world to make it beautiful. You cannot go and redeem a broken world if you haven't been redeemed yourself. And, And it's not, oh, once you're redeemed, then he sends you out. It's as you yield to the process, the Spirit of God will send you out because you never really feel ready for it. You're like, oh God, I'm I'm literally seeing the brokenness of me. And then Jesus is like, you are so beloved. You're beautiful. You're perfect for me. You're perfect for my plan. Go. You're like, what do I what do I give them? Give them me. You are my beloved. It's not it's not like this perfection thing. Right? I just want to say this plainly. The world wants nothing to do with religiosity. They want the beauty of Jesus. When I say religiosity, I mean a self-righteous, holy veneer that covers an unredeemed heart. You can put as much lipstick as you want on a pig, and no one will find it beautiful. The world wants nothing to do with religiosity. It is a stench. It is not beautiful. Nobody wants holy, righteous rhetoric on top of an unredeemed heart. What the world is looking for is the beauty of authentic hearts that in the midst of the now and the not yet, in the midst of the warts and the wounds and the brokennesses and the failures, I am loved by God. And look what he is forming out of me. Those are the testimonies that will prophesy to a world that behind the veneer of the cosmetic beauty that they're trying to curate for themselves are aching for something real. They're aching for something beautiful. They are aching for the slain and standing lamb. And if our God could reveal his holy wounds to us in his reign of glory, how much more should us, the lambs of God, the the dying yet living lambs, that's what we are. This is Paul. Though I die, I live. I carry in my body the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. This is the beauty that the world's looking for, is the beauty of redeemed hearts in process, vulnerably, authentically, gently, meekly offered to the world. Oh, that will prophesy, that will preach, that will start to captivate a world stuck in ankle-deep, cosmetic, curated beauty. Moses was incompetent in his strength, but perfect in his weakness. (laughs) Just needed 40 more years of obscurity and failure, and then he was ready. And then God says, it's time. He's like, you can't use me. Not me. No, no, no. I can't speech. I have a slur problem. I'm not, I'm, no, 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 no. This is the same guy who killed an Egyptian in his own zeal. Don't use me. Don't use me. You see this with Joseph when he finally stands before Pharaoh. He says, it's not in me. It's not in me. 
There's something of when you get to the end of you. When you're like, I don't have it. I, I don't feel beautiful. And Jesus is like, no, no. You are my beloved. Belovedness is what I describe as a grace-drenched beauty. It's when grace has permeated your whole being. The beautiful and ugly places. The warts and the wounds. It's when your whole being is open before God and profoundly loved. Something clicks when you are profoundly loved and what is profoundly broken. It clicks. You're like, I'm beloved. I am loved by God. I am beautiful to God. And when this revelation clicks, it starts to permeate every other place. Deeper and deeper, systematically, Brokenness after brokenness, this revelation that you are beautiful spills into every other relationship. Grace starts to drench not just your inner life, but your outer life. It starts to drench your relationships. It starts to drench in the way that you, you live your life. And this is the thing I just want to say to us, guys, we have to reflect is what, is what kind of beauty is our life prophesying of? Are we pursuing a curated vision of beauty? Because if we're honest in the now and the not yet age where the kingdom is here, but the kingdom is not yet, I think if we're honest and we assess our lives, we all have the places that it's just like beautiful. Yes, God came through the miracle story and we have the not yets. We have the disappointments. Are you, are you open with both of them? Do you, do you show both of them than the way you live your life? Does your Instagram show both of those stories? Probably doesn't. It probably shows one of them because that's the way of the world. Show the beautiful star. Curate yourself. All right, we, we, we must, as the church proclaim, the cross and the resurrection. Testify of the blessing and the burden, the glory and the suffering, desires fulfilled and desires unfulfilled. This is where the beauty of Jesus lies in our story. The authenticity of the Christian is captivating to a world stuck in ankle deep cosmetic superficiality. I'm struggling up here. It's beautiful very authentic. Thank you, Lord. It's now and not yet. I will have a perfect nose in heaven. All of our life prophesies of Jesus. The not yet to his cross to his wounds, to the slaughtered lamb. If we hide the not yet, we are hiding the cross. We're, we're to, it's a version of being ashamed of it. We're hiding the warts and the wounds, the struggles, the sins. We are hiding, we're, we're, we're literally stealing the very place where our crucified one can come and make it all new. The world doesn't want religion. It wants something real. It wants something beautiful. What's beautiful is redemption. What's beautiful are scars that tell a story of overcoming. The not yet, the wounds, the difficult pieces, it prophesies of the cross of our Lord. And if we have the courage to open it before God and recognize that you are loved right now. He loves you right now. He won't love you more when you become more mature. You'll just be more aware of it. He loves your ugly now. He doesn't want your curated cosmetic religious talk. He wants your heart. He wants your wounds. He wants, he wants all of it. And the now, the glorious parts of our life, the, the beautiful parts of our life, it prophesies of the resurrection. That, that 
that all things will be made new, just as this part of our story is being made new. We got to share it. We got to boldly share it. Can't be ashamed of our testimonies of his glory. This is the standing lamb who reigns. And it's beautiful. We're going to close like this. I love just how raw this is. So unpolished. Beautiful. We're going to create space to bring our authentic selves before God tonight. I, I just sense that the Father, as he's revealed Jesus and the beauty of Jesus, he, he also wants to reveal your beauty. He wants to gift a sense of deep belovedness to his bride tonight that you would perhaps feel and know and experience how beautiful God finds you to be. Uh, I'm going to have Jacob Bottles come up. We've, we've, we've tried to showcase a few of the artists tonight. Uh, Michelle painted this beautiful picture of a slaughtered and standing lamb, Zach, expressed through spoken word. Um, Jacob uh, actually created a prophetic gift for everyone in this room. And part of that is because artists are graced by God to reveal beauty. Prophetic artists reveal the beauty of the age to come. And I actually just asked if Jacob would come and he's going to pray over us for a sense of belovedness. Um, I'll also tell you, he, he's a fashion designer. He's created hats, um, beautiful hats. I think he's, he's wearing one, so you'll see it in a second. And he uh, generously created one for every person in this room. As a, as a memento, as a prophetic message. Um, and so we're going to pass them out at the door so you know, there's enough for everyone, so you don't need to worry. Um, but I'm going to have Jake come up and pray, and then we're just going to create a space at the altar uh, for hearts to respond to Jesus and to receive from him uh, a sense of belovedness tonight. So... Jesus, Father, you're the divine, creative being who spoke the cosmos into existence and put even more care than you did for this entire cosmos and crafting each one of us into your image, Lord. Lord, you've been such a generous generous giver you put so much of a yourself inside of us and created us in your image so much that we often tend to worship created things instead of you Lord because you made us in your image and you made us so incredibly beautiful Lord Lord, we thank you for putting your spirit within us, Lord, for redeeming us, Lord. And Lord, that same creative spirit that spoke the cosmos into ex existence, that built our frame and hung flesh on it and breathed into us, lives inside of us. That same spirit inside of Jesus that died on that cross, that bore that cross, lives inside of us. And Lord, I pray that you would move through us. Lord, redeem our stories. I pray you would speak to us, Lord. Expose the beauty of who you are, Lord, in our beauty, in our triumphs, and in our mess. Let our lives be a story, be wrapped up in your story, that God is near, that God is not far off, but he's here. Lord, you're so wrapped up in human, human affairs, not with concern, but with deep, deep love and compassion. Lord, I pray that as you blow on us, Lord, that 
your creative essence, Lord, wouldn't breathe through us, Lord that our testimonies, Lord, would become creative words, Lord, that speak the story of the kingdom that is here and that is to come. Lord, I pray our lives would just be a testimony of your goodness. I pray that you would start in each one of us. Lord, may we not be concerned with the cross that you've given us, Lord, but may we open our arms Lord, I pray that we would get quicker at just reaching up and saying, Dad. Lord, I pray that I wouldn't, my 30 times of trying it on my own would become 20 and would become 10 and would become five. And finally, Lord, I pray that each one of us would, you would disciple us to be so quick to just relent to surrender to your grace, to surrender to your love so that your life, that our lives can become yours and your life can become our life. Lord, that we can walk in you. Thank you for your life, Lord. You truly make all things new, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to open the altars. You know, Brennan Manning, one of my favorite quotes, says, God is always present with our authentic selves. I just want to create space for you to authentically offer yourself to God. Every part of you. Every part of you. The good, the, good, the bad, the ugly, to just offer yourself and uh, this is space. We're gonna we're gonna just create space to worship. That Christ, the hope of glory, lives inside of you. That the beautiful Lamb of God desires to dwell inside of you because you are beloved to God. So just come, come and open your hearts and, and confess. Just 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 tell him, tell him where you are. Just let the gaze of God penetrate into you. We thank you, Father God, for the belovedness that you say that Jesus washes the bride with the water of the word. And we ask, Lord, for a washing from the mouth of Jesus tonight, that the Lamb of heaven will gently and meekly minister in this room and speak into the tender and even wounded places of the sons and daughters of God in this place, Lord. We just say, come Holy Spirit and create beauty. Create beauty here. Create beauty in me. Create beauty in our story. Create beauty in our brokenness. Come and captivate us by beauty tonight, God. We just say, Lord, would you come and grip our hearts with a revelation of heaven's beauty? Would you open our eyes to see the throne? Lord, would you open our eyes to see through the, 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 the superficialities of this world? Lord, would you remove the veil of superficialities, Lord, the places where the desires of our souls have got hung up on temporary things? Lord, the places where the desire of our souls has been taken out Lord, by the worry of wealth and the deceitfulness of riches. God, the places where our souls have been captivated by lesser things, have stuck in addictions, God, stuck in all sorts of bondages. We pray that there will be a sense of the veil being removed and the beauty of Jesus being revealed in this place tonight. Spirit of God, that you will come and tear the veil once again, Spirit of God, and that you will do your work to sanctify, that you will create temples in this room, Lord, places where the glory of God penetrates into the brokenness of man, where the resurrection life of the Spirit penetrates into the dead parts of our stories, Lord. We look to the Lamb and say, have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Jesus. 
I really sense strongly this is a moment of visitation for some in this room, that the Spirit of God is stirring you right now, that you're scared to respond. I just want you to respond in faith because the Spirit of God is going to visit you. There's something being released from heaven for some of you. I have a feeling some of you are crying tears. You don't know why you're crying tears. I just want you to respond. Just respond and come forward. Those tears are the wooing of your heart. Just follow the tears. There was rabbinic tradition that would say that tears were the perfect form of prayer. And if you follow your tears, you're praying right now. Your soul is praying authentically to God. Follow it. Follow the tears. Let the tears bring you to the slain and standing lamb. Thank you. There's a gift of tears. There's tears. I just see tears. There's holy tears that are being gifted. The Spirit of God that you're coming in tears right now. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of tears, for the manifestation of tears. Lord, that you are authoring prayers through tears. That our tears, Lord, are crying out to you. That our tears, our tears, Lord, are saying, come. Come to me here in this not yet. Come to me here in this suffering. Come to me here in this brokenness. Come to me here in in this emotional constipation where I don't know how to feel and I don't know how to pray. Come to me here. We just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're authoring tears, tears of holy repentance. God, tears that will lead to comfort. Tears that are authoring beauty. Oh, just just let the tears flow. Don't control it. This is an opportunity to yield control. Look to the Lamb, the one who extended His hands to the nails, who embraced His cross. Don't hide your tears. Don't do your soul the disservice of shutting it down and keeping it composed. Look to the Lamb. Look to the Lamb and let the tears flow. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. the power 